I hate that I have to make this video. Truly I do. Even as I'm narrating this, I just want to get over with this and get the record straight as internet historians should have done or just not made his video at all. I've known, researched, and spoken about Floyd Collins for the last four years to whoever will listen and in that time I've tried to appeal to several much bigger YouTubers that I respect or otherwise recognize would be able to tell his story correctly. It's an on and off passion for me because Floyd was someone far greater than a media spectacle who met an unfortunate end, as many today now know him as. To just not make this video would be doing everyone a major disservice, especially since no one else appears to be doing this for an internet historian's video. Firstly, I am glad that because of his video, millions of people now know the story of Floyd Collins again, bringing it out of obscurity. And I know that this isn't the first YouTube-based video essay or documentary about Floyd Collins. In fact, not even the only one made that week. But it's no use going down the line of every single video that comes out and does this. And if it was, I would have made this video years ago on someone far less influential. I'm also a longtime viewer of Internet Historian. I first viewed his stuff and I loved it back in 2017 with He Will Not Divide Us. As another content creator who creates documentaries of length and effort, I know that these things can take months, if not sometimes years to make, with editing, voicing, coordination, animation, and otherwise. Two, that making a video that shits on somebody else's work, even where justified, makes me look like I'm nothing but a miserable hater. But this isn't the case. And that doesn't mean that I'm the bad guy automatically for holding him up to the bar he set for himself with this. I have a deep respect for Floyd Collins, and I've researched into him on and off since 2018, and I've also collected several of the records made in the years following his death, as well as read extensively into aspects of his life and death during this time. And since no one else appears to be doing this for Internet Historian's video, looks like I have to be the guy who does it. His video on it clearly took a lot of effort to make, but it's also incredibly clear that he spent more effort with animation, editing, scripting, and making it a collab with other YouTubers than actually doing research into the event itself and what truly transpired. Considering how he gets so many major, crucial details wrong, no matter how his fans may see it, and barely lists any of his sources for information, which mostly conflicts with agreed-upon facts by cavers and historians who spent way more time into researching him, making actual expeditions, interviewing people that were there, and triangulating the press nightmare and everything else, I genuinely believe he's basing a lot of his info off of absolutely nothing but his own imagination. Or lying. He wouldn't be nearly the first person to do that for Floyd, and unfortunately not the last. Not to mention how it clearly looks like that he doesn't really respect the actual incident and how horrible it was. All the memes, Minecraft, and jokes that he's forced in there Call it dark humor and satire all you want. It's disrespectful when everything else is taken into account. Yes, he says this video is journalistic in the disclaimers, but that doesn't actually prove its accuracy. Especially since, again, the sources don't match up to his actual content. All these disclaimers, the majority of people just ignore anyways, unfortunately. Not one of the dozens of people I've talked about this with have pointed out these disclaimers, likely assuming that this is just the same one that you have to put up in any video of this nature, i.e. copyright and don't harass people. The Dollop, an American History podcast, did a great episode on Collins, and there's tons of jokes and bits in there, but the clear difference is, they got their history right. Internet Historian did not. This whole video could have been avoided, or at least a lot tamer, if he would have actually put a disclaimer or something at the start of his video in the description or in the comments saying, Hey, this isn't the full story. I had to leave stuff out and also reinvent stuff. There's a whole lot of other stuff that happened. Look into it for yourself. Or something to that effect. But he chose not to. Which is why I'm even here doing this in the first place. And why I'm quite mad at him. I've looked into this deeply myself double-checking to make sure that what I've said is factual, and I'm listing all of my sources throughout the video itself. I'll say specifically for something that I'm not sure about, too. And there are others who spent more time than the four years that I have with Floyd's story that may know more than me, and I'm sure some of them may even turn up in the comments. 
I even look into the sources that he used too, which makes this even more infuriating and clear how little he actually reads into what he cited. Though most of my info draws from historians and cavers Roger Brucker and Robert Murray in their 1979-1999 through 1999 book Trapped the Story of Floyd Collins, the definitive book on the incident and aftermath, and the most exhaustive, critical look into the event. I highly recommend you read it. I have my own copy of it you're seeing right here, but you can find it on Internet Archive, two editions of it, for free. Last two things before I get into it. One, for sake of time, I'm shortening Internet Historian to IH. Two, if your argument in the comments is the whales of who cares or dude, it's just a video made for entertainment. If you don't like it, don't watch it. So it's not 100% correct. Get over it. It's not supposed to be serious or even the entitled, who are you to say anything about this and think that's somehow a valid argument? Just save it. I've heard the same close-minded, condescending cancer a dozen times already, and it's probably appeared in the comments a dozen more times before you. Find an actual argument. I will admit, though, that in the comments leading up to this on other videos, I've been kind of curt and I got heated at times. But stuff like this and people having the gall to compare me to the yellow journalist who actually directly contributed to Floyd's death, that's my breaking point. IH's video, on the best of days, may score a C plus with the history side of things. It's nowhere near 100% of the story, which nobody would be asking, or its aftermath. This video is showing the major things he got wrong, left out, and also providing further context where needed. A few minor things are littered here and there since I just had the opportunity to and for contrast between the bigger things. Okay, now I'm starting. In the state of Kentucky, there is a cave that every now and then demands a sacrifice. Floyd was the only person to ever die at Sand Cave, no one else. The next sacrifice we have yet to see. And it's unlikely that any human sacrifice was made beforehand due to him being the only one who's dug out this place and made it accessible. By the way, Sand Cave's name was not given by Floyd or the locals, but by the press. The press likely just assumed just because of the sandstone ledges and overhangs of the mouth of the cave, and likely just needed a name to identify from all other caves around the area. He hangs up his jacket and ducks into a five-foot opening, then down a chute he had cleared out months earlier. As far as I'm able to find, as well as ever heard, it wasn't even a full month of work for the total area of the cave up to that point. It was three weeks worth of digging out constantly. Part of this time included setting off a charge of dynamite to clear out some of the larger boulders days prior, and also lighting campfires around the mouth of the cave for it to dry out, undoubtedly raising the temperature of the cave itself. My only guess as to where he gets this from, as well as other overestimations, if put lightly, could be from the press or from the decades of distortion of events by TV, magazine, and even Homer Collins' own book written with John Lehrberger made later. The Turnaround Room Now they call this the Turnaround Room because this is the juncture where even experienced cavers say no thanks and turn around. Because to continue on means going through this. The squeeze. A gap in the stone of only nine inches. Illuminated here is a ten foot drop at the very bottom of this. For the most part, I can understand the confusion of trying to accurately convey the topography of a cave from an outsider's perspective. The press had enough trouble with it themselves as he briefly describes much later. Though of course there's the conflicting accounts from rescuers in later years complicating things. But Roger Brucker and Robert Murray officially mapped out and published diagrams of it again in this same book. They show at the much steeper descent. And Floyd isn't laying entirely prone, but at a rough 45 degree angle, as described by Robert Murray in a 1980 interview also as Floyd being stuck in a barber's chair-like position. The turnaround room, squeeze and shoot, is reversed in IH's description, and there was more than one squeeze. Also, a turnaround room, shoot, squeeze, and the like are also common terms used throughout caving, and you'll see them appear in other caves, as cavers and spelunkers will tell you. 
A turnaround room isn't always used just because a caver has cold feet, but to reposition themselves, such as Homer, Skeets, and others did many times. Size. He slowly shuffles back out, pushing the lantern with his shoulder. Then, oh no. Ding. Crack. Darkness. Leveraging his foot against what he thinks is the cave wall. But that is not the cave wall. That is in fact a rock protruding from the ceiling. As soon as he puts his weight against the rock, it breaks loose. A solid piece weighing 15 kilograms lands directly on his ankle. It aches. But he's okay. to push forward. He cannot. He tries to inch backwards. He cannot. He is stuck. This is a case where the exact details will never be known. But there's several various accounts such as Brucker Murray who state the lantern just fell over and went out. While Alan Hunter states that it fell and broke. How the rock actually dislodged is said to be from anything from his knee knocking it down, him kicking the rock in haste, and him leveraging off it like said here. But in the end, it fell on his left foot. The exact weight of the rock that trapped him is also debated, but consistent accounts such as Brucker Murray states 26 or 27 pounds various times, Hunter says 27, William Halliday in 1976 says 27, and I remember reading somewhere about 29 pounds, but I can't find anything about it now. Mammoth Cave National Park appears to own the rock in private, and from their estimations, it's 26 and a half. I guess 33 pounds like IH says is still in the realm of possibility, but it sure as hell wasn't a 7 ton boulder like the press made up in 1925 though. Also as a quicker side note, without light in a cave, it is pitch black to a stifling degree. Nothing can be seen at all without some light. I know that doesn't work cinematically, but it's worth saying. Floyd has been exploring the caves of Kentucky since he was merely six years old. And as he grew up, he gained a reputation for being a very daring caver. He would dive into some hole on one side of town and emerge miles away on someone else's property. Sup? He grew up and he became embroiled in the Kentucky Cave Wars. Now, there's way too much to go into here, but the summary version is there's this huge network of interconnected caves called Mammoth Caves. It's actually the largest cave system in the world. And there's a city right in the middle of it. Cave City. Real name. So, of course, there are dozens of cave entrances on private property all over the place. Now, farmland in this region has very poor soil, and things do not grow well here. So, cave tourism as a source of income quickly became the prominent So, thing. competition rapidly escalated. Visit my cave. No, no, no. Visit my cave. Big signs were erected saying, Ah, tourists, come to me. Ah, mine is definitely open. Mine is the best. But then competitors would respond by saying, Hey, by the way, we're open, but don't go to that one over there. It's really shitty. In fact, it's dangerous. Despite the fierce competition, Floyd found a cave on his property and he started advertising it to tourists. Of course, very few came. All right, he thought. What if I found something really special and unique? Then surely people would have to come to my cave to see it. So he kept exploring and exploring until he found this hollow. It was filled with big gypsum crystals. And when you were in there, it felt like a completely alien world. But it was barely accessible. This small tunnel is the only way in. He would need to dig for months. He would open it up to tourists, make his cave an incredible attraction, and make his dreams come true. Okay, most of this background of Floyd's origin is wrong on so many levels. I each get the parts about the Kentucky Cave Wars right, but it is the following things afterwards that he leaves out and gets wrong. This is including his whole family, which is a lot more than just Lee and Homer, but it included his birth mother Martha and six other siblings being Elizabeth, Jim, Annie, Andy Lee, Marshall, and Nellie. Elizabeth died after three months and Martha in 1915, to which Lee remarried to a Jane Buckingham. All of the Collins family had contributed in some way or another to the caving industry that was built up around the Mammoth Cave region. Mammoth Cave singular, not plural as he puts it here. It was one cave, not a ton of caves that was known as Mammoth Cave. Though Floyd was by far the best caver in the family, Homer was almost as skilled as Floyd and Marshall had some decent experience being in Crystal Cave. Yes, farming wasn't the greatest with soil, 
but the Collins family did grow a variety of different crops routinely with success. Lee was a teetotaler, someone who never drinks, but it is true that he and Floyd didn't really get along too well and were distant. Floyd deeply understand caving as he grew up, and he collaborated with other expert cavers in the region, exploring Mammoth, Salt's Cave, and discovering two of his own, one being Floyd's Cave around 1910 when he bought 30 acres of land for himself next to his father's property, and then the second, much bigger success in 1917 was Crystal Cave, which goes by several names including Great Crystal Cave, and after his death, now known as Floyd Collins Crystal Cave. Crystal Cave was the one in it that had the Great Crystal Wonders that put him into the Cave Wars. Crystal Cave ended up involving the entire Collins family effort. And when Floyd didn't do well because of competition, talk of selling Crystal Cave started by Lee. And in late 1924, he'd end up begrudgingly agreeing and setting up a deal including Lee and Johnny Gerald. But this caused the relationship between Lee and Floyd to go downhill more. Crystal was Floyd's life work and dream up to that point. His passion for it was unmatched even with the lack of success he had from it. So naturally, he was unwilling for a while to actually sell it. It's likely for this reason then why in this famous 1924 photo that he looks so frustrated and dejected. Perhaps this was used in actual official advertising for Crystal Cave being on the market. His reasoning for finding a new cave was Crystal's lack of popularity due to it being towards the very end of the beaten cave track on a nearly impassable road. He wanted to find an entrance much closer to where they began to get more success and get more people coming. I say entrance because his intuitive theory was that all of these caves were connected and if explored thoroughly enough, he could find his entrance to Mammoth Cave itself much closer and reap the benefits. It is for this reason that he's even looking to Sand Cave in the first place, which wasn't on his property at all, but instead on the property of Farmer B. Doyle, Floyd knows of as a sand hole when he started. He got a deal going on with farmers, including Doyle and others, to split the profits for whatever cave he found. Anything competently written about Floyd always mentions this deal with B. Doyle, Crystal Cave, and why he's even looking to Sand Cave in the first place. It is unescapable to avoid these facts and big details, unless somehow he stupendously thread the needle on not looking into things nearly enough, or more believably saw this in his research and still decided to completely forget all of this and reinvent what happened as many has before him. For reasons you'll see later, IH clearly knew about some of this crucial information as he awkwardly throws in a picture of Crystal Cave signage in his seemingly purposeful bastardization of later events. I'll get to those in a bit. Lastly for this area, something I'm sure that nearly everybody will think is entirely relevant, but considering everything that my regular content is, my regular viewers would hate it if I didn't say something about this. Plus I see so many other people doing the same thing. This is the 1890s through 1920s that you're narrating his life through. Why not use some of the music from one of these decades for added realism? This stuff isn't as strictly monitored as your 50s through present recordings. Not to mention that out of this year, all recordings before 1923 are public domain over here. Getting a video taken down featuring music pre-1929 I've never even heard of before for doing this for about 5 years now myself, or from the vast amount of other 78ers who I know. Even stuff from 1929 onwards are rarely ever struck down until you reach the late 40s. And so what if he gets a copyright claim? He had over a thousand patrons and a sponsor by a ward of tanks among others that would do great here in general. Even if the system recognized the song underneath his narration and other stuff. So there's Floyd in the dark, yelling out for help. He's at the start of a very tiring loop. Sleep. Wake. Yell dark for the next 23 hours. Around the 23 hour mark, a few locals started to suspect that, hey, something might be wrong, and they went to check up on him. And here, they spotted his jacket still hung up. Unusual. They went deeper. However, there was only one person small enough to make it as far as the turnaround room. This was a 17 year old Jewel Estes. He refused to go into the squeeze, but it was close enough to call Colin's name. Floyd! Say a bunch of men who would each show up and take turns heading into the cave in an attempt to reach Collins. But once they reached the turnaround room... Nope. 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 
they would fail to reach him. Emerging from the cave, soaked in mud. Over in Louisville, Floyd's 22-year-old brother, Homer, he gets a phone call. Ah, uh, hello? I see. Ah, my brother. He's trapped in a cave? I'm on my way. Homer jumps on a coach and makes his way to Floyd's cave. Homer struts up to the sink. Dozens of men are standing around outside. He ignores them all and marches right into the cavern, still wearing his city clothes. He makes his way in, down the chute, through the narrowing passages, down on his hands and knees towards the turnaround room. And when he arrives, he does not hesitate. <gasps> he squeezes into the hole, scrambles his way through to the ledge on the other side. He sees Floyd below and slides down to meet him. Floyd! Sup? Right, probably wasn't that casual. Oh, thank God you're here. In reality, what happened that Saturday morning was Marshall Collins, among several others like Joel Estes, were able to get within the chute that led to Floyd, but couldn't actually reach him due to size or fear, such as for Oscar Logsdon, Lewis Brown, and Van Smith, but did what they could from where they were, staying for three hours. Homer, though he was in Louisville earlier in the week, was returning home. Stopping at a nearby gas station at 3.30 in the afternoon, a attendant informed him about what was happening. He arrived 30 minutes later, or at around 4 o'clock. Where does IH get 10 full hours from? It's also at this point that the true events that seem to be outright ignored during the story would be far more humorous or impactful if he just left them in, such as how Homer, to get down to Floyd, had to strip down to his underwear to actually reach him in the chute. Plus, for the not-so-casual dialogue, here's the actual dialogue. Then, Homer went to task. He began removing rocks and gravel, tiny scoop at a time, with the help of an old syrup can. Some accounts say that this is a coffee can, but it is in fact a syrup can. A number 10 syrup can, if anybody wanted to know. On Homer's return to the surface, Floyd asked for Johnny Gerald, which he asked of Jill earlier as well. Many things in this area, IH gets correct, or at least comes close enough apart from the diagram as mentioned earlier. The formula was always the same. Brave heroes go in with food and supplies, then reach the turnaround room and immediately lose their nerve, then dump the food just outside the hole, and then return back outside and go, oh, absolutely, no, he says, thanks for the food, thank you so much. Yum yum. No one would go through that squeeze. Dozens more men would try. All of them would fail. So far, Homer has been the only person to have reached Floyd. And that would continue to be true until... Here we are at the Louisville Courier. There's a spirited young newshawk named William Miller. He's talking to his boss, and he's trying to convince him that it's a great idea for him to cover the story of the man trapped in the cave. Listen up, boss. I'm hearing talk of a man down, down there, and I want to get down there, too. Get to the nitty-gritty, you hear? This is an opportunity for some good PR, Miller. I'm in. But I want us to sponsor that rescue. Picture this. Man saved from cave by Louisville Courier, the finest newspaper in the state. That'll drum up plenty of business. 24 carat idea, boss. I'll make it happen. I'll get down there too sweet. So off Miller goes to Floyd's cave. More. Finally, he gestures to Sand Cave. Listen, you want more information? The hole's right behind me. Why don't you go take a look yourself? Now Miller is only 21, but he is a slender and determined man. He takes on the challenge. So he removes his suit, drapes himself in coveralls, He's now standing on the edge of a 10-foot pit, and he clumsily bumbles his way down. He sat right next to Floyd, ready to interview him. But Floyd didn't really answer any of his questions. In fact, he was incoherent. So Miller took a few mental notes, and he left. He worked his way back through the squeeze, past the turnaround room, and out into the daylight. He is covered in mud and scratches and numb head to toe. And when Homer saw his hope reignited. Someone else had made it to Floyd. You and me, together, we can get Floyd out of there. Up to this point, whether you know it or not, I've tried to give IH the true benefit of the doubt in areas for maybe accidentally doing a very bad job, but still cares about the history. 
but from here onwards, saying that he's lazy towards it and doesn't really care about getting things right and instead spends more time in other areas is the absolute nicest I can truthfully be. I have reason to believe, off of finding nothing supporting any of these statements and conversations, that he purely made this up, or found some batshit news article that vilifies everything about everyone. I lean to the former. This routine of people coming and going and leaving food and supplies in the turnaround room and heading out unfortunately did happen by some, especially by a group of shitty teenagers who then had the audacity to come out with heroic stories of comforting Floyd and feeding him, which Homer saw through immediately. But many were still going in to really help. A fair lot of them actually were getting through the squeeze and reached just shy of Floyd in the shoot, trying to keep him company and talk with him. Those including, again, Oscar Logsdon, Carl Hansen, Lyman Cutliffe, Milton Casey Jones, who was never actually formally associated with Carmichael, Lewis Davis, Ellis Jones, Lum Doyle, Ish Lancaster, Van Smith, and others by Sunday morning, being able to provide blankets to Floyd and more company, not to mention Homer's other trips back in. Nearly all of them made it past the squeeze, just not to Floyd's side. Later, Marshall in desperation made a $500 offer to someone to bring Floyd out, in which an asshat named Clyde Hester took up and tried to claim that Floyd was dead, which prompted a confirmation trip into the cave by one L.B. Hooper, who made it all the way through where others failed and reached his side, talking with him and messing around with his covers too. As for Miller... Obviously, this entire conversation is bullshit, if the needless sex jokes and cheese didn't give that away. But the main points of the conversation are still wrong. Miller had no idea about Floyd at all, but the Courier-Journal did, and not much. This was still the era of the cave wars, and that had a lot of press involvement too. Floyd got into it a little bit as well. A man being trapped in a cave wasn't exactly a new concept for them, and ruses like this had happened before. After the first few days, they had heard conflicting reports of him being out and still trapped. When they did send Miller, yes, there was planned to be a sponsorship, but it didn't even end up happening anyways. Just Miller himself ended up coming down and arriving on Monday morning at 9 a.m., not 10. Also, considering IH's current track record so far in butchering any remaining context, it should be noted that Skeets wasn't the first and only to try to get into the cave. William Halland had, but he lost his nerve and several other journalists were there too. Many other versions of this conversation have been told, even by Skeets and Homer 26 years later in a reunion. So that's understandable. Direct quoting is something I'm being mostly lenient on IH about for this reason, and also the iniquity of this situation where nearly everybody was mentally and physically and sometimes even traumatically exhausted before writing anything down. That is if they even wrote it slash accounted it during this event instead of months years, and decades later, with time for memory to warp and conflate. Other notable things in this area that's wrong is, he skipped over the part where when Miller actually got to Floyd, he actually landed right on top of Floyd, stepping on him and kicking him a little bit. Having to go out and try again, apologizing of course, he stayed with Floyd long enough to learn how specifically he was trapped, and he wasn't as incoherent as IH makes him out to be. When Miller finally did leave Floyd, his whole time in the cave had dramatically altered his life, to the point that when he finally emerged, Miller was crying and filled with a deep sense of pity. Not that I can't appreciate all of the work that was clearly put into this dream sequence, but this could have just as easily been done with Floyd's real dreams and hallucinations, which we actually know a fair bit about them. Like, just before he went into Sand Cave on Friday, he actually had one foreshadowing dream in which he got trapped in there, and then when he told his family about it, they got really upset and prompted a large argument, with Miss Jane and Homer both warning against going into the cave that day. Or the ones Floyd had while down there, along with Homer helping, to which white angels and chariots drawn with horses went by as he begged them to take him along with. 
then going on to dreams of food including chicken sandwiches, liver and onion, especially milk. Dreams also of going home to bed and being able to roll over onto his stomach. As much as I'd love to address every area, I wouldn't be able to get this video out in a realistic timeline. So I'm skipping through some of the other areas at the rope pull, Johnny Gerald's arrival, lighting the cave, and otherwise, which gets more things wrong or close to it. Borrow or buy the book yourself for that, or look into the other sources I've mentioned. I will say though, by this point, Marshall Collins is out of the rescue attempts due to falling ill and having to recover. He wouldn't be back on the scene for yet another three days, but just as support from then on. Word spread about Floyd. Miller's reporting had been picked up by the AP Newswire, and they distributed it amongst their hundreds of partnered newspapers. For Miller, it would be the biggest moment of his Those career. Those buckets were then passed up and down the cavern. And so it Floyd went had been in that cave for over 100 hours now. And seeing everyone working together, Floyd was overcome with a sense of hope and relief. And so he began spilling his heart out to Miller. Here is what he is quoted in the newspaper. I believed I would go to heaven. I can feel that I'm to be taken out alive and with both my feet. I kept thinking, what would happen if the rock above me would fall? It caused me to shudder. I kept thinking to drive my mind to something else, but it wasn't much use. I couldn't do much to help those who came to help me, but I knew that a lot of people were willing to do all in their power. It gave me courage. Tuesday morning, I thought to myself, four days down here and no nearer freedom than I was on the first day. How will it end? Will I get out? I couldn't think of it. I have faced death before. It doesn't frighten me, but it is so long. Tell them I am not going to give up. Tell them I am going to fight and be patient and never forget them. The interview with Miller as IH showed that only put the tiny bit of the entire conversation that was held and uses Floyd out of context too. It caused me to shudder and what would happen if the rock above my head would fall in actuality wasn't directly connected. As he truly said this because of his own efforts to free himself and more. Brooker Murray described everything without quoting him much, but I was able to find two actual sources where everything is intact. One by the Courier Journal itself, issued on February 5th that I'll link down below, and the other by a large article on Mental Floss, showing the full Associated Press transcript. Looking at Mental Floss's article, it's clear to me that IH used this to build the structure and narrative of his video, to the degree of plagiarism almost in some sections. But if that's true, why the hell did he still decide to leave out everything about Crystal Cave's entire existence among other things that they got right? Because apparently, he just wants the narrative to be all about his death in Sand Cave, and just about Sand Cave being inherently evil and cursed, as is becoming apparent. Lever it off Floyd's foot. Cool. The crowbar is now wedged against the rock. Next, he takes a jack. He positions it on top of the crowbar so that it will be forced against the ceiling. However, problem. That jack is too big. It doesn't fit. Miller yells up the tunnel for a smaller one, but this took some time. And when it arrived, too small. Won't reach the ceiling. But instead of sending for another one, Miller takes two blocks of wood and bolsters them underneath the crowbar. Right, so the crowbar now sits higher, it fulcrums against the blocks, and the jack again. is sitting on the same result. Miller tried a new angle. Maybe this time, the jack pressed. The tension increased. And this time, the rock moved. It fucking moved. With each turn, the stone shifted a little more. Miller's hands shook with adrenaline, his face and body dripping with sweat. Pang. One of the blocks slipped, and the wooden tower went sideways. The rock painfully slammed and again, down on Colin's foot, adding blocks, taking them away. New crowbar position, changed the jack position, every angle, all while Floyd was there, cheering him on. For the next four hours he tried, Henry Carmichael. Now, Carmichael was the general superintendent of the Kentucky Rock Asphalt. Casey and another worker spent about an hour in the cave, surveying Casey its slid headfirst into the pit and hastily ladled Floyd some coffee. But Floyd rejected it. No, no. Rumbling intensified from above, 
And in that moment, Casey realized that this was not a plea for sustenance. Burton caught sight and races over to him. Miller just says, for God's sake, just don't let Homer or anyone else back in there. Again, I'd love to talk about everything, but due to time and related, I'm going to have to cut down a lot of what he says here and gets wrong. I found tons of other things. Miller did send for a Sir Jack, not just the two. And his six attempts with it took about an hour, not four. The collapse in the early AM of Wednesday left out John Gerard, who was by Casey Jones' side for a lot of it, and Floyd didn't refuse the coffee, but instead Jones spilled it. But it was still clear that Collins was more interested in the company, though. Miller never once told anyone not to let someone in after his re-entry. And why the hell actually would he, since everyone has been helping him help Floyd? But he heard Collins moaning ahead. So he pushed himself on. He managed to make it through the squeeze and he arrived at the 10-foot pit. Seeing Floyd trapped, he tried to ignore the pebbles that were tumbling behind him. Please, come down. Uh, I can't right now, Floyd, but I will when I get back. Behind Casey, his partner is begging to leave. Below Casey, Collins is pleading for help. Please, I'm so thirsty. Okay. Floyd knew that a cave-in was inevitable. Scared and approaching his fifth day trapped, he was completely at his wit's end. He knew he was about to be trapped in that cave, and he didn't want to be trapped. from the bulb shining Hello. around Floyd's neck were no longer visible. Instead, just sobs could be heard, muffled from behind the rocks. You know, it really kills me how good he did it with the cinematics of it all. Red Dead 2 music at this moment, the echo of everybody's voices, the subtle sounds of rock falling, the almost ever-present hour and day at the top left. All of it sounds and just looks great. If he had just given this amount of attention to the truth of Floyd's plight and context, instead of going for the most basics and bastardizing his story for whatever inane reasons, then this video would be pretty much perfect and I'd have nothing to say about it. Why only bring up Floyd's pitiful sobs and attempts for company at this point and nowhere else? Why not talk about even on this Wednesday when Everett Maddox and Ben Fishback came in to see him whimpering and crying for Johnny and asking to be kissed goodbye? Or what about when Skeets entered into Sand Cave after the collapse with Maddox calling out to Floyd who, out of fear of being alone, pitifully claimed he was free only to be found out when he couldn't reach the milk above him? Or even still, how about when Reverend Roy Hyde and others went down to work at the collapse, Floyd was heard crying out to God and said his final known words, which between babbles was, You're too slow. Too slow. People did not properly understand exactly how Floyd was trapped. And the news didn't help much either. So the obvious question started to arise. Why hasn't he been rescued yet? Just clear some gravel or pull a rope. How is this so hard? Motive was attributed. I heard they didn't even want to have him rescued at all. I heard that they're doing all of this for publicity. And Lee's activity of soliciting donations, remember from before, further inflamed rumors. Other rumors included... I heard that after Floyd went into the cave, someone murdered him. Please contradict statements that I am buried alive in Sand Cave. Stop. Tell mother I am all right. When talking about how the press and people directly interfered with Floyd's plight, IH cites the 1980 discussion with Trapp's co-author Robert Murray for West Kentucky University. Yet the content of that video only hints and infers to the possibility of the things he states here being possible. And again, if he would have taken the time to actually look into things, he would have found the book that lists all of this stuff as blatant yellow journalism. Or had he knowingly found their book by this point and still refused to correct anything before he put his video out. Things go even more downhill whenever he starts talking about the aftermath of his death, incredibly even saying this. Keep holding on, because things are going to continue to get interesting. But first, let me do a wrap up of where everyone is and all that stuff. Context, context. Context, context. In a bit annoyed way, like if it's a chore for him to put actual historical context in, in the very few times he gives any in the whole video through. And how does he do this? By saying things that were false, of course. Things that I've found none of his or any legitimate sources back either. B. Doyle, and supposed friend of Floyd, 
was wholly unsympathetic. He erected a sign on the highway which said, 200 yards away, the body of Floyd Collins is imprisoned in Sand Cave. Then he began charging tourists 50 cents apiece for the opportunity to gander into the hole. While what he did is true, unfortunately, IH lazily uses signage for him in Crystal Cave, which he put the note at the bottom trying to claim that it was all a different name for Sand Cave. Times have been tough for the Collins. So Floyd's dad sold Sand Cave to a dentist. Now Homer begged him not to, because at the time, the government was starting to buy up tons of land in the area and turn it into national parks. And frankly, it's doubtful that he cared about Homer or Floyd or anyone else for that. Lee agreed to a very odd clause. And that clause said, everything on that property belongs to Thomas. And should he wish, for example, to exhume a dead body and re-embalm it and put it on display in something really tacky like a, I don't know, a glass coffin inside a cave, maybe, then that would be his prerogative. Lee signed yes. And Thomas did exactly that. Doyle made Floyd's corpse a tourist attraction. That's right. Two bits of gander. Come and wonder at the incredible dead man who died in a cave. But to add insult to injury, it worked. Visitors returned to Sand Cave to gawk morbidly at Floyd. In 1927, when talking about the Collins family having to sell their home and move away, he frames Lee as not caring about Floyd and agreeing to Floyd being put in the glass coffin in the cave as knowing it's a morbid idea for tourism. In reality, Lee, despite his deteriorating mind, was only told by Harry Thomas that Floyd's exhumation and reburial in Crystal Cave Never Once Sand was because it's what Floyd would have wanted. Not because of the tourist opportunity. But again, he completely ignores the ginormous fact that this is Crystal Cave, an entirely larger and actually accessible system, and pretends Floyd was buried in Sand Cave anyways. So I entirely believe that he could have purposely made Lee look horrible. Every single time for the rest of the video, he changes all of his pre-church burials to be in Sand Cave, so I'm not going to even bother showing it. This is a move that, apart from being a complete lie against reality itself, makes no logical sense already. Look at the topography of Sand Cave itself, let alone the fact that no tourism of the inside of the cave has ever taken place. How would any tourist in their right mind be crawling through the same undisturbed, choking passageways that trapped Floyd and took the skin away from the rescuers that did make it to Floyd before reaching the chasm that he discovered back in 1925 to begin with? Neither Harry Thomas nor B. Doyle took the effort to make the cave more accessible, as was shown by the 1977 expedition to Sand Cave described extensively along with pictures by Roger Brucker in the book and at the beginning of the discussion made with Robert Murray for West Kentucky University in 1980, proving that this cave was still undisturbed. That's why all of the artifacts remained there. They try a number of times to get Floyd returned to them, including through the legal system. But somehow, incredibly, the judge ruled in Thomas's favor. And so, there he lay for the next two years. Nice pictures he used. Want to see what they actually look like uncropped? Oh, look at that. It's Crystal Cave. He's literally putting more effort into pretending Crystal Cave doesn't exist than if he just ditched the Sand Cave Forever narrative, as I'm calling it now. No, it isn't artistic liberties. To make this correct, all he'd have had to do was put in stuff about Crystal back in the beginning. In 1961, Floyd's Cave was purchased by Mammoth Cave National Park, and it was closed. A to the team of people worked over the course of several days to remove him from the cave. They took him out, left the cave, locked it behind them, and laid Floyd to rest at the Mammoth Cave Baptist Church. So the end. So now his video finally ends, leaving out everything not relating to his body. No wrap up for Johnny Gerald or for Robert Burden either. Surprisingly not talking about the exploit ballad and hit song The Death of Floyd Collins that came out later in 1925. 
Of course there wouldn't be any talk about how Collins and Crystal Cave basically created Mammoth Cave National Park and how it connected directly to Mammoth Cave. No talk about how Floyd's theory was proven correct. No talk about how Floyd's plight became carelessly mythologized or anything else in the briefest of words. Just the end. When I see Man in Cave by Internet Historian, I see a sensational retelling of the story by a massively influential speaker that appears to care very little, if not at all, for getting the story straight. Ignores truth, invents new details, and making it just a harrowing story for its entire length. Further distorting the already mostly misunderstood and understated story of Floyd Collins in a disrespectful manner. A sight all too familiar. As in 1964, this happened with the American Legion magazine, which published an article about Floyd Collins that January, which included nearly every myth and cliché about Floyd, put in unsubstantiated details, ignored truth, and went even further to slander the Collins family. American Legion had over 2 million readers. The Collins family sued for a total of $1.5 million in damages, but received only around 20000 in court. Now, I'm sure not going to sue, and I severely doubt anybody else will in this case, though the fact remains. Internet Historian's video gets a ton wrong with it needlessly, knew what he was doing at points, and has undoubtedly caused lasting damage with the false information since posting by the amount of people just hearing this stuff, even if in some ways we haven't seen it yet. Now, it's convenient for many to say at this point, it's everyone's own responsibility to look into this stuff for themselves. While this is true, that doesn't mean that everyone will, as we all know, and I doubt many of you anticipating my video will have done so yourselves. Just believing off of prior experiences with IH, or from how popular or visually appearing it is, that it must be accurate. From the amount of comments and reaction videos I've seen where people believe this unquestionably, I don't know how it could be better shown that people do. This certainly now, at least for me, brings into question the accuracy of other videos he's made in the past. Still more, as one of my friends observed as I showed this to him, Internet Historian's format just doesn't work for things like this. Satirical meme stock images and taking others from costume websites just doesn't sit right. It's cringy at best in this context, and that context meaning true life tragedies. His regular internet-related content is meant for that, and it's funny as hell. But now, my work here is over. I've shown you the flaws of his video. Every one of my sources is publicly accessible for the rest of you. If you continue to retain that man and cave, despite its dishonest reinventing of history, which wants to show itself as fact despite saying otherwise that it's satirical, is somehow a good video, then I can't stop you and I don't think anything will ever convince you. And you've just wasted your own time watching this. As for those of you who were convinced by this and want to know more, I may make more Floyd Collins related content, as there's so many things I'd like to talk about at one point or another, especially not in a response sort of way. There's an entire musical aspect, lesser details, Crystal Cave definitely deserves its own dedicated video, or even videos dedicated to specific people involved, but this video took longer to make than I wanted it to, so I'm going to end it here. Sources are in the credits like always, but per request, also in the description as well. Also, I'm going to ask something that I haven't asked before in 5 plus years. Leave it a like if you liked it, or a dislike if you disliked it. I'm fine with being ratioed. I know what I'm putting out. Anyways, I'll see you guys around.